everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome back to my channel. A while ago I asked you all if you would be interested in hearing about how I made some of my older pre-YouTube costumes, which I still frequently share on Instagram and some of which I have also shared on this channel. And you all said that that would totally be something that you would be interested in seeing, which means that this video here is going to be the first of, potentially, a series of videos about my older costumes. And I'm starting out with the one that always seems to receive the most love from all of you, especially over on Instagram, which is my green wool winter bustle gown. This bustle gown is based on this fashion plate from the English Woman's Domestic Magazine from February of 1876. And I fell in love with that fashion plate quite some time ago. At the time that I started the project, I hadn't actually realized that anyone else had already made this dress as well, but as it turns out, Isabella of Prior Attire had previously made a version of this dress, and yet our two looks seem entirely different, which I kind of love. I started making this ensemble right at the end of 2016, and it was originally made for the Little House weekend that I attended in St. Paul, Minnesota in January of 2017. So in other words, I did not have a ton of time to actually make this outfit. Luckily, I made most of the skirt in about a day, and the entire ensemble somehow only took me about two weeks. Honestly, I wish I knew where that kind of speed went because I definitely do not sew that fast anymore. The skirt consists of six panels and the pattern is from period costume for stage and screen. It's from pattern sheet 24 in that book, but I honestly can't remember if I used pattern A or pattern B, but both of those are my go-to patterns for Bustle Era skirts. The front three panels have three pleats on each side to fit them to the waistband, and the back three panels are all machine gathered into the waistband. The skirt is unlined and has a bit of a train, but there are three sets of tapes inside the skirt, which can be tied together in order to bustle it up and not have it drag so much on the floor. The hem is simply a three quarter inch hem turned up, folded in, and hand sewn in place. No extra structure or anything like that was added. The overskirt was quite a bit more complicated. This one I patterned myself. The back is made of two 36 by 46 inch panels with a seam and opening in the center back. The back panels are knife pleated to the waistband and then the front is one shaped panel which dips down a little bit in the center front and has a few larger pleats that fit it to the waistband. The back of the overskirt is trimmed with three rows of velvet ribbon around the hem and the whole thing is trimmed with three and a quarter inch wide strips of faux fur. By the way, the wool and the velvet ribbon for this project came from the LA Fabric District and then the faux fur I'm pretty sure was from the bargain basement at Costume College. I believe that I started with eight yards of the wool for this and I used every little last bit. The overskirt is lined with black poly matte satin from Joann's because it needed more weight and heft to it. The front of the overskirt actually overlaps onto the back before both layers are incorporated into the waistband together. Because they are two separate pieces, I was able to do the faux fur trimming all along the edges and hem of the front piece, taking the fur almost all the way up to the sides as well. It stops about six and a half inches from the waistband so that the hips don't get too overly bulky because this top part is hidden by the back of the skirts of the jacket. On the back of the overskirt, the fur is applied around the hem and goes up the sides for about 11 inches from the hem as the rest of it is then covered by the overlap of the front piece. The fur was sewn on by a machine on one side and then turned around the edge of the fabric and whipped down by hand on the other side, kind of like a really, really wide binding. There are three large decorative buttons near the edges of the front part of the overlaps, and there are also a series of bow folds in between the overlaps. I actually wound up making these bow pieces out of silvery gray poly matte satin because I couldn't find any ribbon in the right width or color. 
I cut the fabric into three and three quarter inch wide strips and then used a lighter <laughs> to carefully melt the edges of the strips so that it would have a finished look like wide ribbon. On each side where the skirt sides join together, there is a bow made from the strips at the bottom corner of the front and above that are two half bows. These are all hand sewn onto the front of the skirt and then the front of the skirt is tacked to the back overlap of the skirt in a couple of locations so that they don't flap apart. To make the bodice, I started with my go-to Victorian bodice pattern, which I had created in a class taught at the Fifth Avenue Theater earlier that year in 2016. Though it wasn't actually my go-to bodice at the time that I made this, because this was actually the first thing that I used that bodice pattern for. This bodice has two darts on each side of the front panels and a six-piece back, and the wool is flat-lined with black cotton twill. For this specific bodice, it has box pleated peplum in the back that flares out to be really quite full and is about 15 inches long from the waist to the hem. The front of the bodice also extends quite long below the waist, as was popular in this period. Additionally, instead of just having the seams meet at the side of the peplum, as would be standard, the side back part of the peplum actually extends further around to the front so that it can lap under the side of the front piece by about seven inches. These laps, as with the rest of the bodice hem, the bodice neckline, and the sleeve hems are also all trimmed with the strips of the faux fur. And the back of the peplum of the bodice is also trimmed with three rows of the velvet ribbon, just like on the overskirt. Each side of this peplum overlap is also trimmed with a couple of the little silvery gray bow folds, as is the side of the sleeve near the hem. This same silvery gray fabric was also used to create a sewn in sort of dicky or chemise set, which is flat lined with black cotton sateen. This dicky has a standing collar plus two decorative collar points below the standing collar. Both the standing collar and the points are trimmed with two different widths of black velvet ribbon, and the collar also has a row of narrow ivory vintage lace around the edge. There's also a small satin tie attached to the center of the collar. The dicky is hand sewn in place into the bodice neckline, and the bodice and dicky both close up the center front with buttons, though the ones on the dicky are actually slightly smaller than the ones on the rest of the bodice. I actually used one of my favorite sneaky techniques on the bodice buttons, which were black and gold plastic to begin with, and I antiqued them by brushing them lightly with black nail polish. There's also a hidden hook and bar closure, both underneath the satin tie and also in the faux fur trim that runs along the neckline to keep each of these closed. The sleeves are a pretty standard fitted two-piece sleeve, but I did actually wind up having to piece the underside piece of one of the sleeves since I was so short on fabric. The sleeve edges not only have the aforementioned fur and the ribbons trimming them, but they also have a little ruffle of gathered ivory eyelet trim, which peeks out from the bottom of the sleeve. They were supposed to have more of the velvet ribbon on the sleeve as well, like the overskirt and the peplum of the bodice, but I ran out of the velvet ribbon, and since I had purchased it several months prior in the fabric district, I was unable to get more for this project, so no velvet ribbon. The whole ensemble is worn over a lobster tail bustle, a large bustle pad, and a quilted petticoat, plus chemise and corset, obviously. These extra sturdy undergarments really help to balance the weight of the skirts because particularly the overskirt and bodice really do weigh a whole bunch. <laughs> It is a quite toasty ensemble and it serves me well in temperatures from about like the 30s to the very low 60s Fahrenheit. I did also decorate a wool felt hat to match the fashion plate, but I find that I prefer to wear a different hat, a little sort of topper bonnet that I made to go with the skating bustle, which I made at the same time of this, because I just think it has more of that 1870s look. 
I have worn this ensemble several times now, most of which was back in 2017. The first was to a Sherlock Holmes exhibit in Seattle with a group of other costumers, kind of my test drive for the outfit, and then to that Minnesota little house trip that I had mentioned before, which is what I actually made it for. Following that in March, I also wore it to the Port Townsend Victorian Festival. So all of that was in 2017. I have since worn it in 2020 to our annual spooky shoot, and also I've worn it for pictures in my backyard last year when it snowed. <laughs> I definitely need to find more occasions to wear it, but it does make it a little bit challenging because it's honestly probably a bit too warm to wear inside if there's heat on at all. So because I can't just go put this outfit on right now, here's a look at some of my favorite photos and videos from the last two times that I've worn it. enjoyed this deep dive into one of my favorite older costumes that I've ever made. If you have any other questions about this ensemble, please do leave them in the comments and I will try to answer them. You can also check out my old Dream With posts on this ensemble, which I've linked down below so that you can have more information and also some construction photos around there. And please let me know what other pre-YouTube costumes that you'd like to see me share next in this series. You can find all of those older costumes all over my Instagram and occasionally in some of my videos here, such as the every costume I've ever made video from last summer, which I will link down below. If you liked this video though, please go ahead and click the thumbs up icon. And if you'd like to see more videos like this from me, please go ahead and click subscribe and the little bell icon to be notified every time I post a new video. I do post videos here on my YouTube twice a week with my sewing vlogs out on Tuesdays and other random costuming content like this out on Saturdays, but I post every day over on my Instagram, so please go follow me on Instagram, that's at Lady Rebecca Fashions. And if you'd like to help support all of the work that I do on this channel, I do have a link to my Patreon and my Ko-fi down in the description below. I'd also like to give a special shout out to my Edwardian level patrons, Sharon, Julie, and Mirage. Thank you all so, so much for joining me today. Have a wonderful week, and I will see you very soon in my next video. Happy sewing!